Arizona Wildlife Views, brought to you by the sale of hunting and fishing licenses and the Heritage Fund, lottery dollars working for wildlife. Some projects made possible by the Sport Fish and Wildlife Restoration Fund. Welcome to Arizona Wildlife Views. I'm your host, Jim Harkin. On tonight's show, we'll go hiking in the woods to celebrate National Trails Day. Then we'll show you some of the creatures in Arizona who go by the name Predator. But in our first story, we head out to Lake Pleasant to see what the Arizona Game and Fish Department is doing to help preserve the Arizona bald eagles. <laughs> Making your way to one of the bald eagle nests along the banks of Lake Pleasant is not easy. First, there's the long boat ride to an isolated cove. Then there's the hike up the cliff, way up the cliff. Eagles are smart. They build their nests in very inconvenient places, like this one, to keep predators away from their young. This group hiking up the mountain today is not going to harm the birds. In fact, as part of Arizona's bald eagle protection program, biologists from Arizona Game and Fish are going here today to place identification bands on the two new eaglets. Biologist Kyle McCarty makes the last leg of the journey alone as he rappels down the cliff and into the nest. We attached a small video camera to one side of his helmet for a bird's eye view, if you will. That big thing on the other side of his helmet is the counterweight. In this case, a large rock held in place with duct tape. I, wanna, I got to the nest, secured the nestlings uh, so they could come up here for banding. And while I was down there, I was uh, looking in the nest for eggshell fragments that we can measure later the thickness of those and uh, also looking at prey remains and uh, looking for foreign objects like fishing line uh, hooks and, and to remove those. Even though he is very young, this eaglet did his best to defend his roost. Kyle took the extra precaution of gently placing a stick from the nest behind the baby so it didn't accidentally fall out. Once secured, the eaglets are placed in a special bag and hoisted back to the top where they'll be weighed and measured and their ID bands will be attached. He's got a hood on. Why do you think he's got a hood on? Bald eagles are all visual. So you take away their vision and this guy you can see, he's just kind of resting. Yeah. They'll actually, if I put him down and I leave him for two or three minutes, he'll fall asleep because they are all visual. So most of their senses. Now he can hear us, which is why he's shaking. He can hear us, but they're mostly visual. See, this guy's almost asleep now. That's cute. So, so this is to reduce stress, so we're not stressing out the birds. Also, Normally, the only the biologists are allowed into the eagle area while babies are in the nest. But for the first time in conjunction with the Arizona Game and Fish Department's education program, a group of homeschooled students and their families have been invited along to observe the process. Environmental education, in particular, our Focus Wild at Arizona program, um, is doing a lot of lot of outreach type programs. We have some lesson plans that are available online. We do a lot of teacher workshops. But in addition, our homeschool program is is really hopefully starting to take off. With this being kind of the start of it. Outings like this are very important. Um, I stay home to do school, obviously. So when I get to get out of the house to do something like this, it's a lot of fun, especially for something like this because I've always been interested in bald eagles and my family's always like to like study them and talk about them so it was really cool to be able to come and see this. Jamie Driscoll, head of the department's bald eagle program, lets the students get a good look at the work he's doing on the youngster. This male eaglet is about four and a half weeks old and weighs a little over five pounds. Once they get three weeks old then they're okay, okay, they can start regulating their own body temperature. 
this, the black contour feathers start coming in when they hit four and a half to five. So, and then he'll keep on growing these out and he'll eventually get bigger than the adults by the time he's 12 weeks old and leaves the nest. Today was a, is a special, special day for us. It's the first time that we'd have a, had a chance to invite a group of homeschooled students to come out and participate in a banding and learn, learn a little bit about uh, the state that they're living in and, and the work that we do out here. Right now, there are 56 known bald eagle breeding areas in the state. In the late 70s, that number dropped to a low of only 11. But with the conservation efforts implemented since then, the number has continued to grow. I am absolutely encouraged with what I see with the eagles in this state. Uh, the, in the last two years, we found six new breeding areas. Uh, the six years that I've been here, we've found 12 new breeding areas. Um, it's, we, we've tied records for uh, for number of nestlings fledged, fledged each year, and hopefully this year we'll beat that record. Uh, we're, we're hoping to get more than 42 nestlings this year. It's, it's a little funny, a lot of people are surprised that bald eagles are here in Arizona, but we've, we've got quite a number of them. Uh, pretty much what bald eagles need is water and fish. And Arizona does surprisingly have a lot of water and those waters are, are full of fish. So it's, it's got everything that these eagles need in order to nest and produce nestlings. After the eaglets have been banded, they're lowered back into the nest under the watchful eye of their parents, who, though displaying their discontent with the disturbance, never venture very far from the nest. Being down in the nest, I had a few minutes while, while you folks were up here banding them, uh, just to relax and kind of enjoy it, think about where I was, sitting in an eagle's nest, watching these adults flying around, knowing I'm not supposed to be there, but knowing we're doing a good thing. Banding the eaglets is only one part of the Arizona Game and Fish Department's bald eagle management program. You can help with this effort by observing the seasonal closures of about 20 recreational areas during the eagles' breeding season and removing fishing line, which eagles can become entangled in, from the shores of our lakes and rivers. Okay, you ready? Raising awareness of the bald eagle and how to best continue to protect them is the main reason to include the students and their families on this trip. I hope they, they gain a, a greater appreciation of the wildlife and the state in general, the diversity that it has to offer. And maybe in the future, they, they will become some of our conservation pioneers and, 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 and you know, they'll play that out when it goes to ballot um, to save some of these species and, and the management that Game and Fish does. I learned a lot because I came from Minnesota, so I thought I knew a lot about bald eagles, but I learned a lot more. So I found out how much I really didn't know but they're really adorable and the adult ones are really beautiful and I'm glad I was able to come and do this. Well, I saw like a, like a whole bunch of just the bald eagles flying around and then they brought up the baby eagle and it was just like bigger than I thought and it was so cute. It's like cuter than I thought it would be. And I feel like it's more special because they didn't open it up to the public and they only opened it up to us. So I thought of us as being a really special group. I think it was. It was well received. The people seemed to enjoy it. You know, they're already excited about some future events perhaps and, and that they, they really enjoyed getting that close to the eagle. Oh, for me it was, I mean, th those babies just, you know, just two or three feet away from me. I mean, it's a once in a lifetime opportunity. It's way cool. The homeschool students like the bald eagle trip so much that our education department has expanded the program and increased it to a wide variety of field trips. In our next segment, we head up north to the cool pines and the meandering hiking trails of Bill Williams Mountain. America's 200,000 miles of hiking trails allow us access into the natural world for recreation, education, exploration, solitude, inspiration, and much more. However, these miles of meandering footpaths don't just appear on the landscape all by themselves. You want the Pulaski? Either one, whichever one I can borrow from you. Right there. Thank you, sir. We got some good rocks here. Right on. I'll, I'll uh, use some of those. 
It takes plenty of work from volunteers and a lot of dedicated Parks and Forest Service personnel to keep the trails from eroding away. So in 1993, the American Hiking Society launched National Trails Day as an inspiration to trail enthusiasts nationwide to learn about and celebrate trails. I, I'm, I'm envisioning that we're going to plant our rock. And I like right to kind of sketch, yeah, right across here, and then we're going to bring all that material right over right the top of the rock. Yeah. So and so we got a nice transition in and out of the, the drainage feature. A lot of what we were doing today was building drains and also breaking down the berm on the edge of the trail to allow water to flow off the trail a lot better. Um, water is the enemy of the trail. It's, if it flows down the trail, it'll erode it. Volunteers like Patty Venuti and her husband drove in from Pumpkin Center on this Saturday in June to help work on the Bill Williams Trail. A lot of people enjoy the outdoors and uh, we're two of those and we love to hike and we just felt this was a great way to, to meet new people and to do something for the community and uh, the trail system is enjoyed by people all over the world so this just to be part of it. Others, like Larry Schreiner, thought it would be a good idea to get his grandson Trevor out of the house and into the woods for a few hours. Yes, it is. That's number one. Uh, he uh, didn't really want to come that bad this morning. He would rather sit and play on his video game, but I, I told him he had to, <laughs> and, and now, he, now he's happy he came. We get a lot of volunteers to come out and put time and effort into maintaining and building our trails. Um, which are really their trails. Uh, it's land belongs to everybody. It's federal land. A lot of people have a lot of passion about their trails and about the trails that are their favorites. Um, Bill Williams is a big favorite of the community around here. Goes to the top of Bill Williams Mountain and uh, gains about 3,000 feet in elevation. While some of the work can require a lot of heavy lifting, there are plenty of jobs to go around that are not as strenuous. If you live uh, anywhere where you have any maintenance in a yard or anything, it's, it's pretty much the same tools that you'd use at home. I think no matter what uh, their activity level, uh, there's really a job for them. And when it comes to volunteerism, uh, they, they never turn anyone away. So it, everyone can help. Even Ben, the chocolate Labrador, got into the act. But it was difficult to determine exactly how much help he was providing. You're filling in our hole! <laughs> Other than, perhaps, some comic relief. You know, what do they say about working with kids and dogs, right? <laughs> After the crews had been on Bill Williams Mountain all morning, they hiked back to the trailhead for a welcome lunch provided by Williams Clean and Beautiful and the American Legion. National Trails Day is probably my most favorite volunteer event that we sponsor out here. It really gets a lot of buy-in from the folks in the community just because it gives them such a chance to, you know, they can build something on the trail and they can come back years later. And if they were a little kid when they were out here, they can point, point it out to their kids and say, your daddy built that or your mommy built that, you know, 15, 20 years ago. And then they can come out and bring their kids out and they can share that same thing. You know, they can, they can build more trail and just take more ownership in the land. When you think predator, we usually think things like bears, and mountain lions, and wolves. But in this next story, you're going to be surprised at some of the creatures that fit that description. Predator. The mere mention of the word is enough to bring shivers. The lions snarl, the snakes rattle, the wolves howl, some loathe them, some love them. You don't have to be told twice to be on your guard, better stay alert. Are those eyes staring at you? Hungry? Or just curious? Many a Hollywood fortune has been made exploiting the predator-prey relationship. It's time to set the record right.
By definition, a predator is any animal that stalks, kills, and eats another animal. That includes all of the animals one normally thinks of as predators, the mountain lion, coyote, black bear, and wolf. But it also includes the diminutive shrew that attacks and devours a savory cricket. When the lucky crickets evade the shrews, they may find a tarantula hiding in ambush. And it's not just large spiders that prey on the unsuspecting. The common garden spider traps a grasshopper in its web. Wrapping its dinner for later consumption, the spider attaches a final strand of thread and pulls it to the center of the web. There is no doubt that large snakes are effective predators, seeking out and making an easy lunch of an unsuspecting prey. The gecko is certainly no match for the tiny night snake's powerful venom. The snake won't go hungry tonight. Almost all of our watery denizens are predators. The largemouth bass is a voracious feeder. Even the much smaller bluegill will empty a competitor's nest in no time at all. Even our airwaves are full of predators. The magnificent bald eagle swoops down and snags a fish from the lake taking dinner home to the waiting eaglet. Or consider the mighty goshawk. With a few powerful flaps of his wings, the cottontail rabbit falls victim to his powerful talons. The osprey is also called the fishhawk, a name that gracefully displays its predatory nature. As the name implies, this ash-throated flycatcher dines on flies and other insects. Even the beautiful bluebird that many of us invite to our homes is a voracious predator. And don't think you're safe at night either. Bats of all shapes and sizes scour the night skies in search of insects. These predators are so efficient that a single bat can eat his weight in insects every night. And what the bats aren't eating, the owls are. The flammulated owl dines on a small insect, while the larger great horned owl feeds her young on a cottontail rabbit. The cactus ferruginous pygmy owl isn't particular. He'll eat day or night. As fast as the whiptail lizard is, he's no match for the silent, swift flight of the owl. As will the spotted owl, who snatches a field mouse off a tree limb and returns it to her hungry brood. In the circle of life, predators are also prey. What goes around, comes around. In the natural world, predators help keep prey numbers in balance. But it's prey numbers that regulate predator numbers. But what happens when man steps into the picture? In his efforts to bend nature to fit his needs, Man has altered the natural state of affairs. Ever-expanding cities mean the loss of all four habitat components, food, water, shelter, and space in the proper arrangement. Even the simple act of going on a family campout causes the loss of habitat for all things wild. 
From the roads one drives on that cut across historic migration paths, to campsites built on favored fawning grounds, to the damming of our natural riverways. Most of these losses are understandable and necessary to our business of life. Others are not. That's where the Game and Fish Department steps in. The department is charged with managing all the wildlife in the state, prey and predators alike. When times are good and wildlife populations are naturally flourishing, the department takes a hands-off approach. Why fix it when it's not broke? Central Arizona provides a perfect example of how the department manages wildlife populations when things need to be changed. Prescott and Prescott Valley are antelope country, really good antelope country. But as we build more and more homes in their space and pave over their fawning grounds for shopping malls and parking lots, we see fewer and fewer antelope. Where they were once the largest grazers on the grassland, antelope must now share food and water with other introduced ungulates. However, Arizonans want antelope. Allowing these herds to disappear is not an option. The department's mission then is to figure out how to manage those antelope herds. Limiting factor? Urban encroachment into antelope grasslands. One solution? If the grassland can't come to the antelope, take the antelope to the grassland. And that's exactly what we've done in some cases. But to increase total numbers of antelope in those herds, other management techniques need to be employed. Since we can't manage roads, buildings, the weather, and a host of other limiting factors affecting antelope fawn survival, we concentrate on those things that are in our control. Well, pronghorn um, are susceptible to predators. There's uh, certain times of the year when they're more susceptible than others, and that's uh, primarily in the spring during the fawning season. The predator-prey relationship between pronghorn and coyotes uh, goes back throughout history, and it's okay that that happens. It's one of the ways coyotes survive is by finding uh, newborn fawns to, to eat. And uh, it also just works with the pronghorn in the way that they've evolved by dropping more than one animal, typically. Uh, animals typically twin, and the majority of the herd, the does, will drop their fawns within a one-month window. And the idea there is to saturate the area with newborn fawns, uh, knowing, in fact, that, that many of those fawns will be eaten by coyotes, but that several will survive. And all you're looking for is a, a good enough recruitment or survival ship of the newborn um, so that they can replace the older age animals that are dying out of the herd from other causes. But what happens in uh, an unnatural system is a lot of the things that normally work uh, in that dynamics are changed. Uh, when mankind comes in, for instance, we uh, build roads and houses and we will um, isolate small populations of pronghorn, for example. And when those pronghorn are isolated, the areas that they have left to them to fawn are limited. As most of us uh, are aware, coyotes do very well in urban settings. So this doesn't really impede the coyote population at all. And so the coyotes are doing well, and at the fawning season, they've just got these small little pockets to come in and, and work, uh, work their grids, and they can find the pronghorn uh, fawns, and they can do more than their share of predation, and that can affect recruitment to the herd. In other areas of the state, uh, there could be other things that are affecting that relationship, such as extensive grazing or just drought conditions. When this happens, predators may still be doing well because they can switch their prey base to whatever is available. Uh, coyotes are opportunistic and they'll take whatever comes their way. But at critical times of the year, those coyotes that are still doing well will continue to uh, do it a little bit too well on eating the pronghorn fawns and will get no recruitment. When that happens, the department is faced with a really difficult management decision. Uh, we could sit back and watch and see what happens. We may lose the pronghorn herd over time. It may uh, die out of old age with a lack of recruitment. Uh, we could go in and try to move some of the pronghorn from the area if it's deemed that the habitat is no longer uh, viable and going to sustain any pronghorn for time. Or a final option would be to go in and do some short-term uh, predator control. But predators don't always draw the short straw. Consider the plight of the black-footed ferret. This little feller teetered on the brink of extinction most of the 20th century. If ever one animal depended on another, 
the black-footed ferret depends on the prairie dog. When the prairie dog was eliminated from Arizona's landscape, the black-footed ferret also disappeared. In 1996, four black-footed ferrets were reintroduced into holding pens in Aubrey Valley near Seligman. Thanks in large part to the dedicated department employees, black-footed ferrets are now on the comeback in Arizona. This masked bandit with its eerie green eye shine is actually a ferocious predator that stalks prairie dogs in their own burrows, usually in the dead of night. When faced with critical issues involving wildlife predation, such as coyote removal during lambing time, the department's actions are limited in scope and not intended to impact the predator population on a whole. When predator management action is required, the end result is a short-term reduction in the predator population in a relatively small area. The target prey species should immediately benefit from increased recruitment. This respite from predation hopefully will increase total numbers of the species statewide. When this has occurred, the department has effectively managed both predators and prey to ensure that both exist in healthy numbers throughout the state. And that's our show for this evening. If you'd like any more information about anything you saw on the show, go to our website at azgfd.gov. For producers Gary Schaefer and Carol Lind, I'm your host, Jim Harkin. Thanks for watching.